Hello there and welcome to another casual valuation. This time it's Snap, a company that lost 50% of its market cap in a span of a little bit over six years. Back in 2017, on its first day of trading, it ended at $27 a share. Today it's at 13. Now what you'll notice is that for majority of, of its public of its history as a public company for I'd say the first five and a half years, the share price was volatile, but it was kind of within this limit between five six seven dollars a share to 30 35 dollars a share so it was volatile but it didn't really break into any direction up until the end of 20 or close to the end of 2021 then we have this huge surge to over 80 dollars a share and then it went down over 80 percent now to 13 dollars a share so what i want to do in this video is the first part will be related to understanding what Snap is and how it makes money. And hopefully we can explain this search and then decline. And then the second part will be more into the financials and the valuation of the company as a whole. So let's get started. What is Snap and how does it make money? Now, if you take a look at their annual report, uh, they are describing the company or the company is being described as a camera company. And for me, a camera company is one that manufactures and sells cameras, and that's not what Snap does. So I think that's a bit misleading. My definition is that it is a social media company that makes money selling advertising space. And I think that's more appropriate. And actually, they explicitly mentioned that they generate substantially all of the revenue from advertising. Well, they have different core platforms. Um, each one is contributing to the user experience. And I'd like to simplify this whole model into basically what I use for every single social media company. And that is the revenue is equal to the number of users that they have multiplied with the revenue that they can bring per user. And on this chart, what you'll see is the number of users, the number of daily active users in millions. And there are two events that I think are relevant for different purposes. Um, the first one is the IPO. This is, of course, an event very important in the company's history. Back in Q1 2017, they became a public company. And what is common for every public company is that they have a great story. And that story has to be backed up with historical performance. And in the case of Snap, take a look at the number of users, right? The user growth was, looks amazing, right? Well, right after the, the IPO, the growth kind of stopped and actually the, there was even a decline in terms of the daily active users. However, IPOs are being priced and really there's a lot of hype around them. And this is a proof that in most cases, um, we, should, we, we should be very, actually in all cases, we should be cautious about the historical performance and ask ourselves how likely it is that it continues in the future or whether they are just timing the right um, in this case, the right quarter to go public because they're publishing the, the date on quarterly basis. And then we have the second event being the pandemic. And uh, we, we see that the, the increase in the number of users is around that period of time. But if we go back to the first slide, the share price didn't move right away. It was actually Q4 2021 when it started increasing. And the main reason for that is Every time that there is an external event that causes this increase in terms of the number of subscribers, there's always this doubt that these users will just leave the platform when, whenever this external event is over. And same, of course, the pandemic is a great example because there was the lockdown, people were bored, but when there is no lockdown, are they going to still remain on this platform or just go and do their normal other activities? So the trend is quite clear. The, company attracted more more users and it kept growing and it kept growing and it kept growing so it took a couple of quarters until the investors realized well this doesn't seem to be a platform that where the users will leave after the pandemic they're, they're going to stay and of course there was this share price reaction to over 80 dollars a share and then but it, of course with all the hype it always gets to a point that it's just too irrational and as Eminem has said in one of his most popular songs, Lose Yourself, snap back to reality, oh, there it goes, gravity. So the share price um, 
significantly went down but one of the main reasons was just too many too much hype and too many people um, are on to this story of huge growth of course there's a limit to that now speaking of the limit this is what i mean if we take a look at their most established markets us uk australia france the netherlands 90% of the population between 13 and 24 year old are there. And to be honest, I find this a little bit sad. I'm not a big fan of social media or and the impact it has on society. I'm not going to go into that direction. Um, of course, the goal of this video is to focus only on the company. Um, but 90% is a huge percentage. And the question is, where are the new users going to come from in these areas? So they cannot really significantly grow. They need to wait for new, um, new, new children to become teenagers and to join the, the, the platform. But honestly, I don't think that in these most valuable markets, they can grow by expanding the number of users, which means, of course, that the second part is, of the equation is, is important or the, the average revenue per user. Um, and this part and the, the bottom part is kind of a simplified comparison with, uh, with Twitter and with, with Facebook. So Snap, uh, after 10 years of existence, um, or 10 years old in this case, it's mentioned uh, 97 million of users in North America, average revenue per user $31. Twitter at 16 has a lot less users, but much higher average revenue per user. And of course, this whole uh, box is just Facebook, but uh, it's really huge, in term, both in terms of number of users and the average revenue per user that just crazy crazy the, the revenue that they bring so what snap needs to do is of course bring more users in these most valuable markets that will be a challenge but internationally there's a room to grow and then the average revenue per user needs to increase now one of their big bets is augmented reality and uh, if we take a look at the the numbers behind it the number of users that engage with augmented reality per day on average over 250 million um, using AR lenses over 6 billion times per day on average. These are big numbers. And it is the same space where Facebook is expanding, kind of the more, more metaverse related. Um, it is a big space and it could definitely add a new flavor to the whole advertising as well. And what I mean by that is one of the applications is kind of converting these two dimensional photos. So the ones that they have width and height into three dimensional, they call them image assets. So what you'll see down here is we have a two dimensional image, basically these shoes. We could convert them using Snapchat into a three dimensional uh, image and see how those shoes would fit on us. It's just a new way of a new experience. Of course, it's not limited only to shoes. It's also possible for all kinds of clothes and a lot more than that, but it's kind of one of their big bets, in my opinion, that um, they want to keep the users engaged through these new kinds of experience and also sell more ads or more premium ads to, to their clients as well. Of course, not the only other option that they have apart from organic growth is to grow through acquisitions and bring new features to the, ex to the existing users. This is a bit more risky strategy, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. And historically, in the last seven years, as you can see, Snap has done a number of acquisitions, but it's very difficult to judge if they were successful because they're being incorporated into the Snapchat application. And that's pretty much where it all ends. Uh, we have no idea how many of these added value, added synergies, and how many just didn't. So this is a little bit of a more black box for, for me as somebody who's going through the reports. I'm not sure how to um, process this information, whether this strategy works in the long run or not. Now, before we move into the financials, I'd like to point out that these two gentlemen on uh, this photo are the real decision makers. And the reason why I say this is that in majority of the companies, we have the shareholders having the option to vote. For Snap, that's not the case. All of the shares that are being traded publicly on the New York Stock Exchange are Class A common stocks. And they have no voting rights at all. And the Class B and Class C have 1 and 10 voting rights respectfully, but they're not traded. So you cannot really buy a, a share that um, has a voting right. And you might say, well, I mean, 
I want to buy a one share or a thousand share. I'm not going to make a difference at all. So it doesn't really matter if I have the voting rights. And it is absolutely the case that um, the small the small investors, the retail investors, are not going to make a difference. They're not going to, even if they had the right to vote. Their opinion is just yeah, won't be really hurt. Um, however, however, imagine the large institutional investors. Um, they have the option to invest in Snap, a company where they have no voting right, or they could choose another one where they can make changes if they have a good idea of something that would work better in the future, and they could make. So let's say that hypothetically we have two companies, company A and company B. The first one has shares with no voting rights, and the second one, there are, um, or the, the shares have voting rights. And they're both identical in terms of the financials, the structure, everything is the same. Why would somebody buy company A? Well, you don't, you wouldn't, right? Or, or you would like to buy it at a discount, right? So company A would be priced lower because it has no voting rights. And when I mean priced, I mean basically by the large institutional investors, they're just going to be willing to pay less. So the lack of control is uh, is a term in finance that is actually very, it is very common and it's very, in, in practice it's very common that um, these companies are priced 10 to 20% below or lower than the companies that have shares with voting rights. And it's clearly mentioned in the annual report that uh, the two co-founders control over 99% of the voting power of our outstanding capital stock which means they control substantially all outcomes submitted to stockholders. The concentrated control may result in our co-founders voting their shares in their best interest, that is pretty much the whole risk, which might not always be in the interest of our stockholders generally. And these decisions might of course be regarding uh, the future of the company, which direction it will go, but it would also be dividend decisions. That, that's also something that is within uh, their power. So what I'm going to do is, in, in my approach of valuing, I'll, I will value the company as if every shareholder has voting rights, and then I'm going to subtract 15% for the lack of control. I hope that makes it a bit more clear, but if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. Now, if we take a look at the historical financial performance, I mean, it looks great. The, the revenue is growing significantly from 1.2 billion in 2018, now last 12 months and in Q1 2022, almost four and a half billion. And at the same time, the gross margin is increasing. Um, very good financial performance. Same goes for the operating expenses. If we take a look at the R&D as a percentage of revenue from 65% down to below 40. Sales and marketing from around 35 down to 20%. General and administrative from 40 down to below 20 um, they find these improvements in, in majority of these areas. And of course, for, for sales and marketing, they might uh, have better investments or maybe they just don't see the need to invest in these markets where the penetration is at a level that investing wouldn't yield high returns. So from a financial point of view, if we take a look at the income statement, it looks very good. Um, from an, Of course, the, the total operating loss as a percentage was around minus 100%. Now it's actually much closer to, to 15, minus 15%. So the margins are improving um, and they're on the right path in, in that sense. Now, another um, information that we should mention that is inflation and kind of more uncertainty in the coming period that has definitely huge impact uh, on the company. And of course, that's one of the reasons again for the share price decline. So if we think of the company and, and its model, how is how is inflation going to impact Snap? Right, so on one side on the revenue, the companies might not be willing to spend as much on their advertising or they, they might decrease the advertising budget, which means less money for the advertising companies. So the revenues might be a little bit lower per company again. If they manage to bring more companies on board, that would be a different story. But on average, it is expected that the revenue uh, declines. On the other side, and I, I'm referring again on, on a per client. So if they bring more users and more clients, that's a whole different story. But on an individual client, it's more likely that it, it falls. Then we have on the operating expenses. If we think about the operating expenses, 
basically one of the highest expense that Snap has are their the employees and the, the wages and salaries. And in times of inflation, there's pressure to increase wages and salaries. So we have two forces on one side, revenue, probably going to decline it, at least in terms of the number of ads. Maybe they can raise prices, but it's going to be a difficult task. And we have increase in terms of the operating expenses. So the next year will be a little bit difficult. And I would not expect that they improve the margin significantly in the next 12 months purely because of the pressure um, in these two fields. Let's take a look at the assets. Uh, I think it's important to note that their cash position is, is, has grown a lot. 2018, 1.2 billion, now 5 billion. And having a too high, too, too high cash position um, is good, um, but only if there is a good way to, to put it in use. Having just the cash and not, ma not making any use of it is just pretty much destroying value in the long run, especially in times of, of high inflation. So one of the questions that we need to figure out is how did this increase? Because we know that they're not really making money. Uh, I mean, they're not losing now at the moment money because of the share-based compensation, but they're not really making money. And what are they going to do with it? That's still a question that, I mean, they had 2 billion in 2019. They didn't really, of course, they did a couple of acquisitions. That's reflected in the increase of goodwill as well. But it's still 5 billion is a huge, huge number. It is a relatively simple balance sheet to follow. I mean, 5 out of the 9 billion in cash, um, a large part is goodwill. So we can really understand a lot of it with only understanding a couple of lines. So where did the cash come from? Pretty much majority of it came from increase in debt. Long-term debt from below a billion to almost 4 billion as of Q1 2022, a significant increase. Is this a good choice? I think it is because the interest rate that is offered on, on the debt in this period was significantly uh, lower than what it is now and uh, what it will be in the future. But getting a debt at 0.5 or 1% is just really a, really a no-brainer. And I think that actually they made a good decision with this choice but they need to still find a good use of the money. And um, that's something that we need to still see how it plays uh, in the future. And that's actually the most important part. So even though they have almost 4 billion in debt, they have 5 billion in cash. So there isn't really a, a risk that uh, they'll go bankrupt or there's liquidity issues. And again, worth mentioning, they are cash flow positive. Uh, part of the expenses is paid via share-based compensation. So it's diluting the shareholders, but from a cash point of view, they're not losing money. Now the revenue forecast for the next uh, years, if we take a look at Yahoo Finance and the uh, market screener, Yahoo Finance doesn't really update um, the forecasts that often. So a lot of the numbers that are here will be a little bit outdated. Um, the third factor that contributed to the share price uh, decline was the lowered guidance by the management that they expect uh, kind of the, the revenue to grow, but not as much as they anticipated before. So, and they, of course, they, um, the, the reason for that is changing the macro environment. So this 24% is, is uh, I don't think it's uh, any way realistic. Uh, it's also the management clearly stated that they're not going to expect that kind of growth. How, so Yahoo Finance sometimes is a little bit late in updating some of this information, or it could be that the analysts are just not updating their estimates as well. What is interesting is that out of 37 analysts for the full year 2023, some of them are expecting a low of 5.4 billion in revenue, while others are expecting 8.3 billion. So there's huge difference in the expectations for the revenue only two years down the road. So I'm not referring to snap five, 10 years from now, two years down the road, there's a huge gap in expectations. What's good to see is that the operating margin is kind of expected to improve, except for 2022. Again, this is um, what I mentioned. There is a lot of pressure also due to inflation, and I don't think they'll, they'll be able to improve. But take a look at this, minus 64%, minus 34, minus 17. 2024, it's expected that they turn positive, again, based on uh, market screener and, and their estimates. What are my assumptions? Well, I'm a little bit more conservative. and. The reason for that is I'm not sure how next year will or the year after that will play. Maybe this environment will continue for two, three years. Um, and I'd rather be on the safe side 
um, underestimate the performance and if they manage to perform better get the upside then be more optimistic and lose money so if i take a look at my assumptions uh, i expect 15 percent for the next year so again a little bit more conservative than 20 percent not the 30 percent a little bit lower and you can disagree with me and that's perfectly fine um, on the last slide i have this what if scenario so if you're expecting 25 30 percent revenue growth that's absolutely fine there will be a valuation based on those assumptions as well and then you can see where basically your assumptions fall um, in that category operating margin again minus 18 percent for next year and then slowly to improve and year five i'm forecasting 8.8 almost nine percent so really a slow process of improving margins eventually to get to 25 percent and that is my expectation uh, as for the weighted average cost of capital based on the inputs today it's about 8.3 percent but we know that the interest rate is expected to be um or the fed is going to increase the rate so near 10 as a mature company i have a weighted average cost of capital of 10.3 percent but that's again mainly because the risk free rate is going to keep um, increasing over time at least in the next uh, year or two um, at, at least so if we take a look at all of this put together the revenue is growing to 5 billion in the next 12 months and to 16.8 billion in the next 10 years that's a growth growth by 280 percent again that's based on the revenue growth assumption the EBIT this is the operating margin so that includes all of the operating expenses um, as mentioned uh, in year yeah, 10 that's 25 percent then we have the tax subtraction again from a cash point of view additional reinvestments that i expect them to make and then they, we get to the free cash flow and as you can see um, assuming that uh, i take of course the share dilution also into account i expect that all for the next four years they're kind of losing uh, free cash flow or not, or not cash free cash flow positive and putting all this together um, it looks something like this the terminal value or the value of the company 10 years from now 31.4 billion discounted to the day 13.4 billion but until that point, the terminal point, they're going to generate cash flows. That present value is 3.8 billion. So putting these two together, that's 17.2 billion. We know that they have 5 billion in cash. We have to add that. Subtract the debt and subtract the outstanding equity options of 400 million. We get to the value of equity being 17.5 billion. Now, if their shares had voting power, that would have been my valuation, 17.5 billion. But because there is lack of control, I'm adjusting 15% for that. And then the valuation based on my assumption is 14.9 billion or per share roughly $9. And it's crazy to think that five, six years ago, actually, um, the IPO price was $17 a share when the company was much smaller. It just, I find it so interesting, the, the power of, this, of storytelling and you know, selling this. To the public it's it, it's always interesting to see and i'm not surprised that today is at 13 dollars a share but these assumptions are as i said a bit more conservative so the nine dollars is kind of my more realistic still scenario but it's more on the on the more on the safe side now you could have completely different assumptions than mine and um, if you basically change your assumptions if you have different assumptions than mine regarding the margins Again, my assumption were 25% with 280% growth in revenue. That's the 9.1. What I encourage you to do is take a look at your assumptions and try to forecast the next 10 years in terms of revenue and see where you fell, fall in this category and then also same for the margins. But try to understand why. Um, why are you expecting, for example, 20 or 25 or 30% margin? And same goes for the revenue. How, how much should a company grow to get to, to increase revenue by 550% um, and see where your valuation kind of falls within this table. What I think is, is a, something that could happen is a potential acquisition that, that Snapchat, not that they make an acquisition, but that they get acquired by another company because the current price is actually, it could be seen as attractive uh, for companies that are not very active in this space and would like to get some exposure. But of course, um, there could be that I'm missing something. There's something big coming from Snap. 
at the moment based on the financials, based on the, the fundamentals. Of, on the fundamentals, I do not see that. Um, but well, one way to see what the future brings and also the five billion in cash, where is that going to go um, and whether that will be a good decision or not? This would be all regarding this video. Thank you as always for following it until the very end. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.